Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the transfigured Christ. Amen. Not quite a year ago, our Bethel Lutheran staff was on a staff building retreat. We did many enjoyable things together. The most intriguing part of the day was an escape challenge. The 20 people were divided into two groups of 10. Each group was ushered into a room or rooms where clues needed to be found, dozens of clues, and deciphered in order to successfully escape the room within one hour. My group was ardent in its tasks. It seemed we left no stone unturned, and yet we weren't making the best progress in the world. As I had been searching for clues, I thought perhaps I, I saw a shortcut to success. Uh, without going into detail, I will tell you the shortcut worked. And we were immediately in, ushered into a new room through a door that opened for us. How clever. Uh, not so much. The uh, managers of Escape Challenge were monitoring us by camera. And while they hadn't seen exactly what I had done to circumvent their system, uh, they said to the people who were standing around that it would be very difficult for my team to complete the challenge because we had skipped a few steps. How clever. Too clever by half. Now, the Bible isn't too impressed with cleverness. Oh, true, in the Proverbs, once in a while, a wise person is described as clever. But for the most part, being clever is not an honorable attribute in the Bible. It begins right away in the Garden of Eden, Genesis, the third chapter, in which the serpent is described as the most clever of all the animals, as the serpent convinces Adam and Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit. In the Gospels, Jesus tells a story about a clever or a shrewd manager who is about to lose his job so that he will have friends after he's been dumped from his job. He calls his boss's debtors in and slashes their bills by half and marks them as paid in full. A very clever way to get friends. Not very honorable in cheating your boss out of even more money. And then in the second letter of Peter, from which we have read today, the author says, we did not follow cleverly designed myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Cleverly designed myths. Being clever in the Bible doesn't really mean much. Peter underscores that in the second chapter by saying, these teachers will exploit you in their greed with the stories they have made up. Sometimes we are too clever for our own good. That's true even in the church. 500 years ago this year, Martin Luther tacked his 95 theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Forty-five times, I will underscore that, 45 times in 95 theses, Luther rails against the sale of indulgences. That is, pieces of paper that will kind of get you out of trouble with God. Lest we believe that indulgences were a problem only in Luther's day, they were sold 400 years before he was born. Indulgences are still available today. You cannot buy one. The, the sale of indulgences was outlawed in 1567, not long after Martin Luther died. But acts of charity and other acts of generosity help you earn an indulgence today. In Martin Luther's day, indulgences, the sale of indulgences was was terribly abused. They were mercilessly sold so that they could earn money to build the great St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the second largest church in the world and likely the most beautiful. 
But the building of that basilica came at a cost. It came at a cleverly devised myth that somehow one could buy oneself into rightness with God. How clever. Too clever by half. Do not listen, Peter says, to those people who would come to you with a pie in the sky, by and by story that cannot be verified. We have eyewitnesses. Peter says, don't listen to these made-up stories. There are plenty of eyewitnesses, three of them prime being Peter, James, and John. We have their words in the Bible, either from their own hands or from a close secretary or disciple that they have used to present part of the story of Jesus Christ. We have oral histories that are dependable, handed down through generations before they were finally committed to papyrus through a stylus. We have many eyewitnesses. There is a, a Josephus historian, secular historian, who continually refers to Jesus as a historical figure. Through archaeology these days, we are coming upon ever more artifacts that verify things that happened in the Bible, not deny them. Don't listen to these others. Listen to the eyewitnesses, to the majesty. And part of the majesty surely is the transfiguration of our Lord, which we have read about in our gospel from Matthew for today. In this story, Peter, James, and John do not come off as shining examples of the faith. True, they have seen an amazing thing. They've seen Jesus shining like the sun. And somehow they see Elijah and Moses, the two paragons of faith from the Old Testament, show up with Jesus. But it's the voice. It's the voice that gets them. Cloud overshadows. And from the cloud a voice, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And at the sound of the voice, these three cower in fear, falling to the ground. That's exemplary of one of the many reasons why I trust the Bible, the stories of the Bible. You see, the Bible presents not just the good things, it presents the good, the bad, and the ugly. We consider Peter, of course, amongst the prime disciples. He is of the inner core. Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. It is Peter who first declares Jesus as the Christ of Peter. Jesus says, you are the rock on whom I will build my church. Peter is a hero. But he is a hero with clay feet. It is fairly common for Peter to act impulsively or to even make mistakes. He makes two mistakes just in our short transfiguration story for today. In his confusion, when he sees things going on, he runs up to Jesus and says, uh, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's good that I'm here. <laughs> you know, if, it's, if it's good with you, I'll build uh, three, I'll build, I'll build three dwellings here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. What in the world is that? And then when the voice comes, he, along with the other two, fall to the ground in fear. This, this Peter guy is a hero? Well, yes, he's a hero. He's a Christian hero. Peter shows to us that even rocks can have faults and cracks. The Bible doesn't tell stories of fairy tales where each day gets better and better than the day before. The Bible tells stories of real life where there are ups and downs, there are hills and valleys. The Bible tells stories of people persevering through often difficult times, but always taking comfort and hope in the one who created and the one who sustains the earth. Even just think about the Jesus story. The Jesus story isn't very clever. 
the Son of God, being tried by the Son of God, being tried by a kangaroo court, being stripped of all that he has, and being convicted. The Son of God, the, the Son of God, being sentenced to death and hung on a cross, one of the most cruel methods of capital punishment in, in this day, in his day. The Son of God dying. This is not a clever story. This, uh, this is preposterous. Well, it's preposterous if it were not for all the eyewitnesses. Preposterous except for the fact that it is true. There will be people who come to us with cleverly devised myths. According to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the answer to the ultimate question is 42. Of course, they will tell you then they don't know what the question is. When asked the ultimate question of life, the electronic Siri has a few responses. One of her responses is, I don't know, but there is an app for that. Yeah, some think that technology will save us, uh, but that is a cleverly devised myth. A different answer Siri gives to the meaning of life is chocolate. Now that's one we can bite into. M maybe, maybe the ultimate answer is money, including money to buy off God through indulgences and find eternal hope. Ah, but money, money is a cleverly devised myth. Peter would implore us to live in the power of the Lord of majesty. Money and fame and chocolate will all pass away. In the end, we will be praising the one who shines like the sun. We will look up and we will see Jesus himself alone. Praise to Jesus. Amen. Hymn 316, please.